Good. Today, we are going to have a slightly shorter lecture and talk about secondary structure and amino acid properties. This is, to some extent, a rehash of the very first lecture we gave, uh, for good reasons. You've been through a tough week of lots of statistical physics. We've been looking at entropy, free energy, enthalpies, and everything. And I'm not going to try to tie up the sack here in a bit, refer back to lots of the things we talked about on Monday. And I'm also give a couple of summary things that we're going to cover after Easter. So as we're, what we'll gradually get into, I'll cover in a minute, but I would suggest that we start with these study questions that we've been doing the previous weeks too, and go through them. 14, it's a bit shorter here. Uh, pick one of them each, and uh, we can skip number three because that's gonna take too long to go through. Uh, but uh, pick one among the others and try to provide an answer to it, and then we'll see whether it's something we should discuss more. Any takers? One. Okay, difference between Helmholtz and Gibbs? Um, yeah. I can say that Helmholtz free energy is free energy for phases and GHP energy is free energy for chemistry. Uh, but also, they, it's almost the same, but Gibbs free energy has also the enthalpy. No, so well, Almost right. Uh, so the enthalpy, both of them have enthalpy. So the thing we previously called energy, we should always call enthalpy. Uh, the Gibbs free energy in the enthalpy, in Helmholtz, the enthalpy is exactly identical to the potential energy. In Gibbs, the enthalpy also includes this PV term from pressure. Uh, what I would suggest that you normally do, or rather, what I frequently do, what most of us frequently do, we talk about Gibbs, but we use Helmholtz and have a little bit bad conscience for it. Uh, because Gibbs is the one, Gibbs is what describes what happens in the lab. We need to include the work that we do when the pressure and volume can change. But then we know that in practice that term is so small that we typically ignore it. So that's why I say, call it Gibbs. In practice we use Helmholtz and we should have just a little bad conscience that we should really have included the pressure. But we know that it's so small that we can ignore it. Unless you're building nuclear devices. But I don't think, actually, I think we still have the export control. So you, we promise not to do that in our computers. <laughs> okay, some other questions? Uh, what is epsilon roughly inside a protein? Mm -hmm. You said three yesterday. Yes, that's ballpark. And pretty much anything between two and five or so is perfectly fine. 10 is starting to be a bit high, and it's not one because it's not vacuum. You have some electrons in here that can shield things. And I guess 11, why does it go down in high frequency? Is, as the frequency gets so high, then the water molecules are changing direction, and that takes time? Right, so the, the point with 11 is that there are really, there are two components, right? At, at the very start, when you go from epsilon 1 to epsilon 2, that's mostly an effect of the electrons. The electrons are super fast. But beyond that, most of the effect of screening in water in particular is actually, it's not an electronic effect, but it's a molecular effect that the entire molecule is turning. But it's, molecules do not turn instantly. So once you get up to megahertz or something, the molecules don't have time to follow it. And that is also the reason I bring this up, but the book doesn't talk about this, but as you eventually go into simulation, it's gonna sound really strange that we use epsilon one in simulations, but we still claim that water has epsilon 60 to 80. Uh, and the reason for that is simply that we, st we actually, of course, in the simulation where things can move, we include the molecular polarizability, as you say, that the molecules can rotate. So it actually works really well. So this depends on whether you're looking at the world from an atomic perspective or whether you're looking at the world from a continuum perspective in mathematics. Both are fine. So they're not as incompatible as it might sound. And that kind of answers tend to, that the role of epsilon is to provide some screening. Um, why is the water, why does water have such a high uh, value of this epsilon? This could actually be epsilon r, the relative epsilon. Uh, why is the value for water so extremely high? It's a very strong yes, strong charges and it's a small molecule, so it's very efficient to rotate. Other ones? 
is seven definition of temperature. Um, it's the derivative of energy when you're talking about entropy, right? Yes, and you don't, and whether it's uh, energy or enthalpy or something, that's a detail. And I'm, this is one of those definitions you can look it up when you need it. The point is that it's possible to define temperature from entropy. And energy. experiments in which you use two solvents, one of them is very hydrophobic and this one used to be water or something uh, not so hydrophobic, so it's the ratio by which some molecule is uh, yeah, shared between the two. Solvents. Exactly, so partition coefficient, the traditional way of defining partition coefficient would be how much is solvated in water compared to how much is solvated in oil. Uh, there's actually a reason why I brought this up. That's quite right, that is the traditional way of defining it, but if you think, if you just look at experiments, we use partition coefficients all the time. Because in experiments, the probability of A versus the probability of B. So you can actually extend this the second you're comparing two outcomes, and that could be spectroscopy, it could be insertion of a membrane protein, it could be folding. Pretty much everything is that you use some relative probability of things to go from probabilities back to a difference in free energy. And that's, you're literally inverting the Boltzmann distribution. Okay, we have a couple of good ones remaining. How does the hydrophobic effect vary with temperature? Any takers? While the temperature increases, the hydrophobic effect increases? Yes, and why? Um, because of the Exactly. Because it's a, primarily it's an entropic effect, and we don't really gain much in entropy, but we keep destroying the energy parts. Uh, had, had the hydrophobic effect been an energy effect, we would likely have reduced this as the temperature goes up. And that kind of relates to number four. What is the difference between hydrogen bonding in vacuo and water? Exactly, and this is also part of a much wider concept that any time, it's very easy to look at something and say that this is good, but you need to determine what is the reference state that you're comparing to. And in this particular case, in vacuo, the reference state is not having a hydrogen bond, and compare, having a hydrogen bond is sure better than not having one. But in this case, in water, the only difference is where do we have the hydrogen bond, we will always have them. And this occurs in tons of other cases in biophysics and other things too, so you can never, I would, to be a bit extreme, I would say you can never say anything about one state. And whether this is one molecule or one absorbance or anything, one spectroscopic result, one microscopy image, it's always a matter of what are you comparing it to. Relative things are interesting, absolute things rarely say anything. With one exception. Uh, remember yesterday that uh, I realized right in the middle of the slide that I had there was a strange thing that the, the, enter, the delta in entropy, whether that would be negative or positive. I actually added a note on that in the lecture recording. And the reason why I kind of uh, stumbled upon myself there is that in the previous slide, the reason why I said that an entropy is larger than zero uh, is that I was talking about the, what is the entropy of, for instance, of a water that can rotate, uh, things like that one. And then entropy, in theory, an entropy is an arbitrary scale, right? But since we typically, what would happen if I talk about not an entropy difference, but an absolute entropy, it would be very strange if they could be negative. Why? This is not an obvious question. How did you define entropy? You talked about that in the lab yesterday. Yes, but not count, uh, forget about the constant for a second, uh, but not just counting microstates. Logarithm. The logarithm of the microstates. So if a lo what is the logarithm of one? Zero. zero. So if something is smaller than zero, you would have less than one state. And you can't really have 0.9 states. 
that, that's kind of, it's non-logical, right? So when it comes to entropies, and that's why we typically say that absolute zero, the entropy is zero, then we have one state, nothing moves. But any other entropy has to be higher than that, so that's why you can talk about the negative difference in entropy, but an absolute entropy, we actually want them to be absolute in a sense. Um, other fun stuff. Yes, there are still some. Topic, but I have a question. In absolute zero, yep. are this, uh, nothing moves, does this also include electrons, for example? No. Um, uh, so this gets really complicated. It goes far beyond this course. Or actually, in a classical world, the answer would be yes. But there is something, there is a very deep theorem in quantum mechanics called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Uh, and that shows that the product of the uncertainty in position and the uncertainty in the velocity is always greater than or equal to a very small fundamental constant, which is related to Planck's constants. And the problem is that the better you know your position, the less accurate you know your velocity, and vice versa. And this ends up being a problem at absolute zero, right? Because at absolute zero, if nothing moves, then by definition your error in velocity is zero and then you no longer know exactly what your position is. So that very, and you can actually show this quantum uh, with experiments too, so very close to zero, you start having absolute zero, you start having these quantum effects. Uh, so in a classical world, the answer would be yes. In a quantum mechanics world, the answer is no. And there's a classical joke about that, too, that the police stops Heisenberg for having speed. And I said, do you have any idea how fast you were going? No, but I know exactly where I were. Relevant and irrelevant energy barriers. That's an important one. Number two, at 300 Kelvin, mind you. This might sound stupid. Why should you know these things by heart? And it also gives you this, yes, but, but that you could look up. But the point, there are some things that you really need to have a gut feeling for. And I, there's a really good example for that. I'll, I'll show you that in a couple of minutes. Because my hope for you in your career in a couple of years, you're going to be the same voice in the room. When somebody says something, they say, no, but sorry, that's a really good idea, but I know that that can't be relevant in this case because that energy difference is far too small or far too large. So that can't be the reason. You don't, need to, you don't need to spend an afternoon calculating it. You don't need to spend a week simulating it. It's impossible. And that's why it's, if you know those things by heart, you can say that straight off in two seconds, it's irrelevant. It can't be the case. So what energy barriers are relevant? And if you're really smart, you can cheat here. So what you should you compare them to? KT. So if you're really smart, you're going to say what? <laughs> KT, which is, I'm going to ask you about this every single lecture until every one of you says what it is immediately. <laughs> point 0.6 what? Per mole. So point 0.6 kilocal per mole, roughly KT, that's a relevant and important region. Things that are substantially larger or substantially smaller than that, we don't care about because they're not going to, either they happen all the time or it doesn't happen at all. So the energy barriers that are interested are in the range of KT, within roughly one order of magnitude. Um, high energy bonding partition coefficients. Why are free energy symptomatic coupled to experiments? That relates to the partition coefficients, right? That this is, the interpretation of the experiment is pretty much always a free energy. Um, hydrophobic effect. And the reason why the hydrophobic effect is well correlated with nonpolar area Oh, that's kind of, I'm, I'm going to ask that, it's kind of easy. Uh, I'll take the easy ones to you, the difficult ones. Uh, and the reason for that is that the amount of water that has to reorient, it's, of course, it's an entropic effect in water, and the amount of water that has to reorient is the first approximation proportional to this nonpolar areas. As I showed you in that plot yesterday, and I might pick up some articles, don't knock down on these first order approximations. I would even argue that the first order approximations are far better than the fourth order approximations because the, the fourth order approximations, the really complicated advanced approximations, they might work really well in an advanced case, but suddenly you're forgetting something and that advanced model goes completely off the table. 
First order approximations are rarely perfect, but they're rarely completely wrong either. And in many cases, they are surprisingly good. Uh, we have used a whole lot of them in uh, papers we've published. So try to stick to first order models. It helps you focus on what's relevant rather than the really complicated stuff. Number 13, why the book says, and I actually like that, one, electrostatics in waters originates not from energy, but from entropy. It's a bit extreme uh, because to some, of course, electrostatics, the electrostatic interactions are related to entalpies, but what does it mean by that? Roughly as well. It's also that electrostatics in general is related to this concept of the hydrogen bonds, right? We're always interacting with something and the electrostatic interactions are so strong that you will do almost anything to find an interaction partner. For instance, water and hydrogen bonds. And that at the end of the day means that the electrostatic enthalpy or energy is pretty much constant. And what rather happens is that to keep this constant, the molecules will have to reorient. They will have to form another bond or something. And that means that it manifests itself as entropy. I might not say that exactly, that it doesn't originate from energy because the electrostatics is energy, but that it manifests itself as entropy. And the way we show that is the temperature. This is not a theoretical argument. We can show that with the temperature dependence of the free energy. That is entropy. It's all entropy. Titratable amino acid we'll talk about today too, so I'll, I'll skip that a little bit. The idea with the rest of this course um, that I'm going to start today is that we're now going to gradually going to go back from the super simple systems in physics, water and everything and head more back to proteins. Even the labs uh, after Easter, after we're going to have a one week break, but after that we're going to have one more lab when you start looking at kinetics. That is not just whether things happen or not between these different states, but also a bit on how fast they happen. But then we will gradually start building real models, first of uh, liquids and everything, simulating real things at room temperature. And then at some point you're going to be simulating proteins and start to looking at least at some simple transitions in proteins. The one caveat here is simulations of real proteins can still be relatively expensive so that uh, you can't complete an entire simulation in an afternoon. In some cases you will do simple ones and then we might provide you with some trajectories from other simulations. There's some pretty cool stuff you can do here, and it's all based on the simple theories. You remember those, uh, all those curves I had, and I, was, I even managed to confuse myself yesterday, which is not very difficult. Uh, now we're going to have a bit of a practical here to see where, how smart you are. Forget about the entropy and the enthalpy parts for a second, um, and let's look at the, one of the simplest systems we can imagine, pure water. So what this plot says is that as a function of temperature, water can exist in three phases. We have free energy here, it's G's, it's Gibbs. And the green one here is how the free energy of the liquid water roughly varies. The blue one is the solid and the red one is the gas. So what can you say from that one? This is not difficult. But what does this say? And right, and in between that we have water. So we have roughly zero degrees centigrade here and roughly 100 degrees centigrade here, right? Um, so that's, that's where we have liquid water. Simple, plain, and easy. This is an old, I wouldn't necessarily call it a scientific scandal, but it's an important memento mori. There, is, there are some links if you want to read more about this. I put some links about that on the resources. In 1962, a Russian scientist called Nikolai Fedyakin, uh, who was far out in the countryside in Russia, had some very strange experimental results that when he was pushing water through very, very thin capillaries, under some conditions, and he repeated this a number of times, cleaned the capillaries and everything, but under some conditions, he kind of saw that water spontaneously underwent some condensation at room temperature and pressure. So that's almost that if the water was polymerizing. So the water got a, it was much thicker, uh, change in viscosity, change diffusion processes. And uh, what's more, you even got a big change in uh, melting and boiling temperature. So that, um, 
I forgot what his original name for this was, but uh, eventually you had the Deryagin, was a very famous big uh, Russian scientist, one of the most famous in the 1900s, take this up. And this led to a new field called polywater. And the argument was that under some conditions, water would essentially polymerize into some complicated structure, small structure, so they would still be liquid and everything, but it would have very different properties from normal water. And this was picked up in particular by Lippincott in the US, so this is June 1969, and eventually there were a bunch of US scientists that uh, were very active in this too. The amazing thing is that this water would then have a freezing point in the ballpark of either all the way down to almost a little bit over 200 Kelvin and maybe up to 240 Kelvin. So a freezing point that was significantly lower. And it would have a boiling point of this poly water that was like 500 Kelvin, so up here. Now, you obviously know that this is, well, the reason why you haven't heard about this, this was, of course, wrong. You have no idea that so there were like hundreds of papers published on this. It was also in the middle of the Cold War in the 1960s. So popular media picked up this, and people in the US were afraid that Russia were developing a poly water gap. Uh, and if it wasn't so sad, it would actually, in hindsight, it's pretty fun. There is something astronomically wrong with this. Um, I'm not sure whether it was a coincidence, but a year after this, in 1963, Kurt Vonnegut published a book called Cat's Cradle, uh, where he had talked about a hypothetical form of ice, ice 9, that would freeze already, the water would freeze at 45 degrees centigrade or something. And the idea is that if this ice 9 came in contact with your body or anything, this would catalyze a reaction and immediately cause your entire body to freeze. Uh, this is very close to poly water. But based on what you know now, you should have been able to debunk this in a minute. How? It's simpler than that. Um, so what I, what I would suggest you do, um, we, we have, it's, it's actually worth uh, spending a couple of minutes because this helps. Occasionally, we are so focused on knowledge and knowing facts, right? This helps you to think. And thinking is the most important thing you can do. Try to imagine where, what the curve for poly water would be in this diagram, and then debunk it. I would suggest, th let's do this, let's spend 10 minutes on this. So first talk to the neighbor right next to you. Or next, let's spend two minutes thinking about this yourself first. First two minutes yourself, and then we're gonna have you talking to your neighbor. Two minutes is not a lot, so let's start now. Think about this yourself with paper and pen first. So the key thing is that those two items and that diagram. And if you're watching this online, you're going to have to wait. <laughs> That's the advantage of showing up for the lectures. I think we almost have two minutes there. So now we just take, talk to your neighbor and see if you can, either you already know this and then you just tell your neighbor what it is uh, and otherwise try to reason together. And it's still the same question. Try to explain this because ultimately you're all going to explain this to me. Yeah, because the transition, yeah, I think so the transition, basis is the transition points is where the green line 
crosses the blue one. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, and then so you kind of move it. Uh, so move, I, I imagine moving the green line downwards, and then the cross points will be more on the left side. So at lower temperature. And at the same time, it would be also more on the right side, so at higher temperature for the gas. But this is like you can't tell what. I think you're on the right track. So it's about moving the green curve, uh, Kate, whatever, pink curve. But then the idea, compare the pink curve to the green curve. Compare polywater to normal water. Are you getting anywhere? No. Okay, I'll give you a clue. Uh, and then uh, do this in two steps. First, you have the green curve here. This is present water. Imagine creating whatever, orange curve, the curve for poly water. What would the curve for poly water look like here? And then compare poly water to normal water. And that would lead to some pretty absurd effects. Well, this was a clue. I didn't say that I would provide the answer. Spend another minute talking between the two of you, and then you're all going to talk together. So do you imagine the, the green curve, you move it downwards, and then the, the intersection between the blue and the green line, it is more to the left side. What that implies, actually, So talk 20 more seconds. Try to say what, what, you, what you're going to try to tell the others or ask them. And then we'll have all of you talked. And then two minutes after that, see if you can provide me with the answer. No, so that's sorry. The temperature at Kelvin here. Remember that, uh, not centigrade. So. That looks good. That looks really good. But what does it mean? What would it mean if it was true? <laughs> I think all your curves look really good, but the question is, what will it mean? That's usually the hardest part, right? But you know what? Let's have all of you discuss this, uh, uh, or well, pairs or uh, quartets or everybody around the table. Discuss them if you want. You have the curve, but what will this mean, and why is that absurd? Should we do it together? Sure. So where would the curve be? So it would be below liquid water. So we would have the curve roughly here, right? What would that mean? Is it that the free energy hasn't changed or changing to a solid? So, so let's see. If you are at 50 degrees centigrade here, what phase are you in? Liquid, liquid. Why? Because that's where it is on the curve? Or? 
Sorry, because I, you, I just didn't hear you. It might have been right. That's where it is on the curve. How do you mean that is where? Why is it not red or blue? Okay, and you just said where would poly water be? So if you had poly water here, where would you be at 50 degrees? Poly water. So you just say that poly water should be the most stable state of water. You would never have liquid water. Now, in theory, you could, of course, if I had this gigantic energy gap, so you would never get to poly water or something. The probability that in 4.3 billion years, nature would never have done this is starting to be pretty low, right? And there was a famous Richard Feynman, he debunked this in like 10 seconds, that if poly water existed, there would be an animal feeding of poly water and just, sorry, feeding of normal water and just excrementing poly water. And then this animal would have an infinite amount of energy that it could live from. So here's the beauty, that there were like a couple of hundred pretty good research groups who spent a decade on this. Just wait, it's pure crap. If you just think a little bit about free energies and everything, you could have said in five minutes, it's impossible. I'm not going to waste my career on that. You have no idea what the error is. In this case, it eventually turned out that there were impurities or possibly some sweat or human uh, amino acids and everything in this water eventually. Why it doesn't work is relevant. Just with some simple logics and thermodynamics of studying free energy, you can say that this is impossible. There is no way this can happen. And that's what's so useful with these gut feelings. Um, it doesn't matter, you see, there is not even any Y scale here. There isn't any X scale. You have no idea what the exact temperature is. You have no idea what the exact free energy is. You have no idea what the entropy is or what the enthalpy is. It doesn't matter. It's very simple principles. And this is the cool part. You can, you can reason about things without knowing anything numerically about them. And if you didn't follow this perfectly, you're in pretty good company of some, a bunch of people who were close to the Nobel Prize and everything. So, but the point is that these things are very powerful if you do it right. And if you want to read more about this, there are some links on the uh, web pages. What I'm going to talk about today is polypeptide chains. Uh, we're going to come back a little bit to structure turns. And uh, I might not spend that much of time on it. Originally, I didn't have as much secondary structure in my first slides. But since I have a bunch of different slides, it's just stupid not to share these slides with you. So I might jump through some slides here a bit quicker. Uh, if you feel that you still would like to talk about them, let me know and I'll pause there and spend more time on it. But it might be useful for you when you look into this later. So the first one we're going to come back to is the energy landscape. And since I brought up energy landscapes, I'm not going to talk about what they are. But since you now know both enthalpy and entropy, there are some things we can start thinking about here. When you're exploring an energy landscape, what is, there is, of course, there are some barriers, peaks here, there are some deep wells. But what is preventing you from exploring the entire energy landscape? What is the biggest difference here? Is it enthalpy or entropy? Well, that's a difficult question. Uh, in general, you can't say. It can be either or. But it turns out that in different parts of the energy landscapes, there are different things preventing you from this. Uh, if you are here and would like to go up here, what is it What is that prevents you from going there to going there? Enthalpy, Enthalpy yes. You need, and this is essentially the Boltzmann distribution, you need to wait until you by chance have enough energy that you will somehow go up there. And that might require a very high temperature. Going in the other direction might, well, if, it's, if you are there, I'm going to go down there. That's going to happen automatically. If you are here and need to go down there, it depends on temperature. Because if this energy barrier is so high that it's significantly higher than KT, it's going to take a while before you get there. And uh, eventually, on the other hand, if this energy barrier is smaller than KT, you're going to jump over it fairly easy and be able to go down. But at some point, and in this case, I'm not sure whether this is an ideal representative energy landscape, but at some point you're going to be in these regions with hundreds of peaks, hundreds of barriers, and hundreds of small wells. And then it's more about entropy. Because then it's kind of a process where you need to search, right? You need to try lots of different confirmations. And it's not obvious that one, the next confirmation you're trying is significantly better from the previous ones. And it's not until you've tried a very large number of this you will find the best ones. What, do you think, what process here do you think is fastest? Exploring things that are energy or entropy? Enthalpy, right. So that 
it takes time to search through entropy because there are so many states to try out. And that's going to be, we will see later, that's actually the main reason why protein folding takes time. It's primarily an entropic search problem. You need to explore phase space. Um, and that's why it's actually more useful than you think to think about these energy landscapes. The Monday after Easter, we're going to have a lab where we go back to your very simple systems, but we're going to look more in terms of kinetics, that occasionally you need to visit intermediate states that has a much higher energy, but you can't get to this state without crossing the intermediate states, which is also very similar to the lecture we heard before the, uh, the seminar we heard before the lecture today. So we're going to go back to secondary structure now. Um, you probably know the secondary structure, but we're going to try to think in slightly different ways. We should try to identify the delta G components of these secondary structures. We will try to think what happens during folding and why specific interactions or entropy are important. What are the different properties of these secondary structures? If you really love this, the books will spend chapter after chapter after chapter on this in the intermediate half. My idea is that I will probably not do that. It's beautiful and if you're interested in physics and seeing the beauty of physics in structure, it's certainly a couple of fun chapters to read. But after Easter, I think that it will be more useful for us to go more toward real systems and we're going to try to do some models and simulations of these things. So if we start with the simplest one, alpha helices, uh, we're kind of going to ignore the other helices for now. The characteristic thing of an alpha helix that you should remember is that it's characterized by each residue hydrogen bonding a residue four units further down the chain. So you have a hydrogen there to an oxygen there, hydrogen there to an oxygen there, etc. And this continues round and round and round the chain. This is also the reason why proline breaks alpha helices because proline lacks that hydrogen on the peptide bond. So suddenly it's going to be one of those hydrogen bonds you can't form. If you look at the structure, what is it that favors folding and what is that would disfavor folding? Because not every single amino acid in the world will form an alpha helix, right? So the reason why an alpha helix forms must somehow be that the delta G in some cases is good and delta G in some other cases is not as good or even positive. And this delta G consists of two terms that you should know by now, enthalpy and entropy. So whether an alpha helix will form will apparently be a balance between enthalpy and entropy. Exactly when it's good or bad is complicated, but already now you should be able to identify what, let's take the easy part first. This is good, and anybody can answer if they want. Uh, pick out, try to identify either the entropy or the enthalpy part. When you have an alpha helix forming, uh, what is the effect on enthalpy and what is the effect on entropy? I'm guessing the enthalpy would be the formation of the bond. The hydrogen bond. And you see, this is the, they said the enthalpy is the, is the hydrogen bond. It's good energy. And this is the advantage of daring to answer quick because you just pick the easy one. Uh, the next person will have to explain the entropy. The entropy is the fact that you form a helix, so it has to look like a Yes, and that effective means rather than having a chain that's completely free, right? The entropy here means that the first hydrogen bond will have to lock three residues in place so that previously you would have three residues, at least if they were glycine, they would be almost free to explore the Ramachandran diagram, right? The, the phi and psi torsions could be anything they want. In a helix, we have locked in the phi and psi torsion to an exact value. They can't move at all anymore. That's really bad from an entropy point of view. So the only question is then, do we gain more with the forma strong formation of these hydrogen bonds inside the helix than we lose by locking the entropy, by locking the helix in place. So here's the problem. Um, the reason why do you, if this is a good structure, and in many cases it is a good structure, why would not, it still takes a finite time for an alpha helix to fold. Can you imagine why? So let, let's, yes, the fact that will have to happen in a particular, the reason, sorry, the reason I'm repeating some of these things I realize is that we have it in the recording, otherwise people will just hear me speaking. It's right, but let's look at this from the start here. Um, residue zero first. So residue zero is just one residue. Um, so let's, what happens when you're going to add residue one to the alpha helix? What parts will be good and what parts will be bad? 
And I'll, I won't draw it there, because, but I'm going to have to draw that here. So we have number of residues in helix. And then let's draw some delta, delta G here. And I'll start with residue, just one residue. And then we are here, completely arbitrary. So what happens when I add one more residue to the helix? And why does delta G go up? Because you decrease the entropy, but not gain any. Exactly. So the, the, se the second residue I'm adding here, I have to lock that in, but I'm not getting a single hydrogen bond. So I only get the bad component, and I don't get anything good. This is not looking good. I just went up in free energy. That's not what, where nature wants to go. And then we start with the second residue, well, or second or third. I'm a programmer originally, and that's why I like start counting at zero. Apologies. What happens with the second residue we're adding to this? It goes up again. Shit. Uh, what happens to the third? I'm going to count zero, one, two. What happens to the third we're adding? Well, no, that's zero, one, two, three. The three is the third one. And the, what happens with the fourth one we're adding? So with fourth one, now things start happening. We will still get that penalty. So we will go up. But now we gain an entire hydrogen bond. So what likely happens is suddenly we're down here or something. So we went up one bit, but then down quite a bit. And then the fifth one we're adding, that's going to be even better. Because on average per residue, the gain in hydrogen bond has to be better than the loss, uh, than the loss of the conformational freedom. So then we keep going down. And then we keep going down. And we keep going down. So what this leads to is something you're going to test in the lab next Monday. So that you start, apparently you have some, we're not, you're not going to test it for an alpha helix. But apparently you have some state here where you start. You're going to have an end state that is really good. But to get to your end state, you have to pass a state in between here that's actually worse. And that's what you call a transition state. As you already saw in the lab, right, the Boltzmann distribution will fix that. Nature does not just go downhill in energy landscape. We occasionally can go up L2. So how quickly this happens will depend on how high this transition state is. If this is 100 kcal per mole, we would never see any helix forming. So how fast helices form and whether they will form will depend on how high this transition state is in the middle. Without knowing anything, and this is pure guess, do you think that this transition state is really good or really bad for an alpha helix? Is it a high barrier you need to start, go over to start an alpha helix? Well, it's hard to say. Think about it for a second. Uh, I'll come back to it when we talk about beta sheets. We already talked a little bit about titratable amino acids, and I will show you a quick move. Oh, no, I'm going to talk a little bit before I show you the movie. This is an example of a membrane protein, uh, which is the voltage sensor in all your voltage-gated ion channels. Yesterday, I said that in most cases, if you put a titratable amino acid inside a protein, it will usually lose its charge so that it becomes neutral so we can bury it. But there are exceptions. There are some really important charges. And this is even a membrane protein. If I said that there is a charged side chain, that's right, that's a titratable side chain in a membrane protein, your first guess should be what? That, yes. Well, either eat my lid. That's actually a very good answer because that, that's likely an incorrect prediction. And you are in better company than you think. So one of the first structures of this, when it was attached to an entire membrane protein, the group who determined that structure said that there is no way this can be true. So this entire, it's called S3, and this is a third segment, and this is the fourth, so it's called S3 and S4. So they actually argued this entire thing must be a paddle that sits in the membrane interface, and then it must move through the entire membrane. Do you think that's a good or bad idea? Why? Well, so the, the problem, it's not an entirely bad idea. Uh, and there are many good things there. So this person was Rod McKinnon, who got a Nobel Prize for some of the structures. So that he is, Rod is an amazingly smart person, and Rod, of course, realized that it's going to be very bad to have the side chains in the middle of the membrane. Uh, then, of course, I, in, in, in Rod's defense, too, they also realized that this is, this is a structure they saw in the X-ray crystal. It does not necessarily mean that it's a biologically active structure. 
there might be something stabilizing this on the way. But yes, it is a bit of a challenge to move something charged through a membrane. The only problem is that he's also right. Because if this one is responsible for all your heartbeats, if you have it charged and subject that to an electric field, it's going to move. And if you don't have a charge there, it's not going to move. And then you would not have anything happening, right? So if you want something opening every time you have the electrocardiogram, there's a nerve signal. And actually, this is also what conducts nerve signals in every single cell in your body. Having that charge there is pretty much important. You could argue it's one of the most important protein parts in your body. And for a long time, we have debated this. But the cool thing nowadays, we can even do simulations. So this is run on a gigantic special machine in New York, uh, David Shaw. So you see that the time scales here, we can simulate things like a quarter of a millisecond. And eventually, we'll see that this entire segment is moving down. And you don't see the rest of the channel here. But this motion will push on the channel pore and actually close the channel. So here we can simulate things. Exactly why these can exist in membrane proteins, I'll get back to. But the point is that titratable amino acids, occasionally, they are super important. And they can really, they're exceptionally functional. And this was an entire alpha helical membrane protein, too. Um, if you had looked really carefully, you might have seen that there were some residues there that were almost a bit twisted, so that they were twisted so that they were almost thinner. And that's actually partly a 310 helix. But for all intents and purposes, it's alpha helix that's the most important one. Forget about the pi helix. Forget about the 27 helix. Uh, you can never have a helix where a residue binds to its next residue. That would be too tight. But this so-called 310 helix. It's a helix, so rather than binding four neighbors up, you're turning, twisting the helix so it's a bit tighter, and that just moves the hydrogen bond one step further. So rather than binding to four neighbors apart, we bind to three neighbors apart. And I will actually, I'll skip that slide. It's just another view of a helix. Um, forget, 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 forget. Alpha helix here in the middle of the right hand diagram. And then the right-handed 310 helix is right next to the alpha helix. You see that they're very close. You virtually never see an entire 310 helix in a protein, but you might see a couple of residues in the middle or at the end of an alpha helix that wound just slightly tighter. Those two you need to know, and then you need to know about the beta sheets. But the beta sheets are not part of a helix, but its own secondary structure. So we've already talked about the beta strands. The strand is the individual part. The sheet are all five or how many you have. Let's think about this the same way we thought about an alpha helix. What is that favors folding? And what is that disfavors folding of a beta sheet? What happens when we fold the beta sheet? The favorable part is all the bonds in between. Hydrogen bonds here, too. So hydrogen bonds are kind of important in proteins, as you probably realize now. What is the bad part? Exactly, the loss of entropy. Um, is the loss of entropy here better or worse than for an alpha helix? Mm -hmm. Think about what I said about physics, first order approximations. <laughs> exactly. Well, you can, of course, go into details. I bet you can find arguments for or against. If you don't know, if you know exactly, Sarah, do you know exactly why it's worse or better? Okay. The first order approximation is the same. Unless you know why it's more, don't try to be too smart. Because when you try to be too smart, that's where you go wrong. The first, again, a beta sheet two, just as the Ramachandran diagram I showed, right? This is also one region in the Ramachandran diagram. And then ideal beta sheet is pretty much one point here, just as an ideal alpha helix is one point. Yes, you could argue that the region up there might be slightly larger or anything, but just because this is stretched out, we are pretty much locking every amino acid here exactly in place. And that's the first order approximation. So let's start to pick something here and fold it. Let's start down here. What happens? The first residue, well, let's ignore it. The first residue has some sort of free energy delta G, right? And then we add the second residue to the beta sheet. What happens? What, is, what changes and in what direction? You don't have the other four beta sheets. You're going to go up in free energy. Why? Because you haven't made any hydrogen. You can't make any hydrogen bonds, but we keep blocking this one in. And then we add the second residue. And what's going to happen? We keep going up in free energy. 
And the third one, I'll take the liberty of saying that we still go up. What happens with the fourth one, roughly where we would be with an alpha helix by the fourth residue, we would start going down. What happens with the beta sheet? We keep going up, right? And a beta sheet might be at least 10, if not 20 residues long here. So we're going to have a much higher initiation barrier to a beta sheet. It will take much longer. We're going to need to lock all these structures in before we can even start forming a hydrogen bond with a second chain or something. So already here, you don't know anything. We haven't even talked about the specific energy of a hydrogen bond or anything. But you can already here say that it has to be a much higher initiation barrier to form a beta sheet. So can you think which one of these structures will fold fastest? Alpha helices. Do you think that's right? Yes. yes, by several orders of magnitude. And uh, that, there are lots of other things to come into, but I think that that's enough, really. Do you see the point? You don't need to, we talked about a couple of lectures ago, what is the volume or something? The more stuff you add, the more you confuse your mind. We could, of course, have started to measure exactly what is the entropy here, what is the number of microstates, what is the specific energy of a hydrogen bond. The more numbers you start to add, the, the larger the risk that you make an error in a minus sign somewhere, as I did yesterday. Um, and the more stuff you have, the more likely you are to go wrong. If you're just thinking of principles and first order approximations, you rarely go wrong. But in real life, is the, so the beta sheet actually fall slower because of this initiation barrier? Yes. But I would have guessed that it is more because you have to wait for all of the other to be synthesized. But also if you had all the residues that you sort of let them go so now you're complicating something. When you're saying that waiting for them to be synthesized, you're adding the ribosome here. And in principle, there is no end to the number of complications you can have when you add a biological system. But you remember what Christian Amfinsen said. So that you don't need the ribosome. In general, a protein exists in the global thermodynamic minimum. And this is a much more important comment than we thought. Can the free energy depend on whether it was folded in a test tube or whether it was folded through a ribosome. I would say that the difference in the initial dependent state, it, it is the same, but the, yeah, the higher value would be deeper. Because exactly. it's not the same if you say, if, so the way you put it, that yeah, you lock in all the residues mm -hmm. and until you don't get, you don't Sure, and that's fine. We're talking about first order approximation, but I just, just for the recording, the important thing that you got quite right here, the free energy is what you call a state property. The free energy only depends on the state, not how you got there. So by definition, the free energy of a beta sheet compared to the free energy of the residue in water is not in any way affected how you fold the beta sheet. Now, on the other end, the transition state on the way to beta sheet folding, that could in principle vary between things, but trust me, so beta sheets fold much slower than alpha helices, in particular in isolation in water. Uh, there are some exceptions, of course, if you have two proteins that already have beta sheets, if these beta sheets then get together and form a larger beta sheets, then you already have them pre-existing. But in general, this is a much more complicated entropic search problem than the alpha helix. The alpha helix is a local structure. There are different ways of forming these beta sheets too. They can be either parallel or anti-parallel. These are the numbers of the residues. And you might just be aware that there are slightly different hydrogen bond formation patterns here, but this is probably something you can study yourself by looking at the lecture notes. Beta sheets will also have this property that they're pleated. And that's literally a property of the amino acid chain. It's not something we're ever gonna use, but if you ever hear somebody talk about pleated sheets, this is why they're pleated. They also have a property because this might sound so amazing, right? It's, it's kind of insane that the beta sheets are perfectly planar. It's 180 degrees all the time. Why on earth would nature be, be so perfect that it just happened to have its perfect upside down? Well, I'll go back and show that just to the ideal picture. Why would nature be so perfect that saying that this exactly 180 degree turns all the time and they would be perfectly planar? It's kind of amazing. What a coincidence. Well, apart from the fact that it isn't a coincidence. It isn't exactly 180 degrees. Uh, the first approximation is 180 degrees. In practice, it's like 178 or so. And that will means that beta sheets will have this slight twist. So if you see, if you go from here to there, it will twist some, I think it's roughly 20 degrees per strand or so. And uh, that's why you, you will see this in protein structures when you have very large street that it, it will start to turn. 
Another very special property of beta sheets, an alpha helix really has a start and an end. And at the end of the alpha helix, you have some residues in a coil shape or something before you can form the next alpha helix. With beta sheets, nature occasionally manages to do this, that you go up. Let's see. N, C, A, C. No, we go up there. Uh, no. N, C, A. Oh, doesn't matter. There we have the C. You go up here, and then you have this the last hydrogen bond there, and they make a super tight turn, and then you go down again. So here you don't really, you, you don't have any free or flexible residues between the sheets, and there are special names for these. They can be called type. There are a bunch of different turn classifications, but the point is that these turns are to, so tight that they are really part of the secondary structure, and that's why occasionally you can have very nice and flexible beta sheets. But they're much harder to form than alpha helices. We're not going to go through that in detail, um, and there's a reason for that I will tell you in two slides. Um, the book goes through, in principle, you can study the physics here. You can start to make predictions about when will different types of secondary structures form, etc. And some of the very first people who did this was uh, Chow and Fassman. And uh, this led to the first implementations of programs that could predict secondary structure. I'll leave it, and they will leave it there hanging, because I know that you've been predicting secondary structure. Guess whether you or they were better. If you don't try to predict this, but do it experimentally, there are two simple ways. No, there are two ways to determine secondary structure. There's one very simple. We call it CD spectroscopy. These machines are dirt cheap. So this builds on the fact that amino acids are chiral, so they will polarize, they will turn circular polarized light in slightly different ways. So depending on the wavelength of the light, you will get these very specific curves that correspond to the red one is alpha helix, the blue one is beta sheet, uh, the green one is random coil. And in principle, you can just have a simple equation with, uh, that says what is the fraction of alpha helix, the fraction of beta sheet, and the remainder would be coil. And then you could just fit your data to these curves. The advantage is that you don't need a whole lot of sample. It's cheap, it's very quick. The drawback is that you have absolutely no sequence resolution whatsoever. You can tell if a sample is almost entirely alpha helix. And this is what was used in many of those very early uh, trials, that if you just want to study whether a protein folds or something, for instance, the way Christian Amfinsen did it, you can use fluorescence. Or you can use a simple method like this, because if the entire alpha helix here unfolds, you would see the curve fall down to the green one here, right? And if the protein refolds, it would go up to the red again. The only problem is you can't say anything about the structure. You can just say that, okay, now it's alpha helix and now it's not alpha helix. It's used in very simple biophysical experiments. It's rarely used for large proteins. For large proteins, if you actually want some sequence resolution, you can use NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. Do you know about NMR? But NMR is kind of a fun method because it's a failed method in physics. Um, so in principle, in physics, the idea is you could study the spins, and it actually came from solid-state physics originally. The only problem with NMR is that, and the reason why it's problematic in physics, is that this resonance frequencies will be influenced by their neighbor atoms, which means that it's very hard to get things systematic. And the funny thing is that the so-called failure, in quotes, in physics is what we use in chemistry. Because it's influenced by its neighbors, these shifts so in, the, in chemistry, we're not necessarily interested in the absolute frequency, but we're interested in how the resonance frequencies are changing based on the surrounding, which in particular enables you to predict structure. Secondary structure is easy to predict with NMR. Predicting a structure of an entire protein is much harder, but with secondary structure, it works very well. So what would you use? If I gave you a protein and say that we need to determine the secondary structure of this protein. Use the predictor I made. Exactly, you would use the bioinformatics predictors. Um, do you have any idea, I don't remember, do you know, remember what accuracy you got in your predictor? 75%. Okay. Do you have any idea of these early two Fassman rules? Like 50, right? Not even, like 40 or something. So that you are an, I wouldn't say an order of magnitude, that it's hard to talk about these percents. Getting the further up you go, the harder it gets, right? So getting the last few percents is insanely difficult. And the problem with simple two Fassman rules is they only look at the local, the, the next three, four neighbors. While you're, you have learned from billions of years of evolution, you're looking at the entire protein background. 
their Chow Fassman were they're not even close. And they've pretty much this was the beginning of all the bioinformatics. It's just 40 years ago. Your accuracy is pretty much the same as NMR. NMR, good NMR spectroscopists would say I'm wrong, and that's perfectly fine. But I would also say on average, an average computational predictor is likely going to do about as good as an average NMR experiment. Um, there are, of course, some exceptions. There are some very special things that if it's something that's not really based on evolution, some specific design you do, that might be hard for the predictor to pick up. But unless there is some very special reason to think that there might be that this structure might be stranger or something, it's hardly worth doing this experiment. It's, it's not expensive, but it takes time and you need a collaborator. Just do, do the theoretical predictor and that's going to be perfectly fine. So cryo-EM is not uh, an ideal method to determine secondary structure. Cry -E because cryo-EM is, cry -E is in many ways the opposite of NMR, although they both study. Uh, so NMR works really well for these local features. It's easy to find these shifts. The larger a structure gets, the more complicated it is to get right with uh, NMR. Cryo-EM comes from the other direction. So with cryo-EM, the larger a protein is, the, the easier it is to find its overall shape. And then the smaller structures you want to look at, the harder it is to get things right with cryem. We can get this with cryem too. And of course, at the end of the day, you have the entire structure. And then the cryem secondary structure might improve a bit on yours. But the reason why it's in practice, it's, very, it's even hard to define secondary structure beyond 80% or so in a protein. You always have a couple of loops. Those loops are flexible. Uh, we can say that it's coil, but when it's frozen in the crystal, it might be closer to a helix. Uh, anytime you have a helix, and I can move to the next slide, so have, anytime you have a helix here, the, the end and beginning of the helix will fluctuate a bit. So that particular residue might sometimes be a helix and sometimes be coil. Yes, it would be, in, but you can't really get beyond 85% uh, because it's not defined on that level. Well, that depends. Why do you want the 3D structure? In many cases, yes, but in many cases, it might be perfectly fine. The, the goal is what you want to use the 3D structure for. I, I would certainly agree it's great to have the 3D structure, but in some cases, you might have, say, 500 receptors. You want to compare something, and there might be some interesting transition between helix and coil, or that one of them does not have a helix. The uh, cryem is much faster than x-ray. We can do things with cryem. In best case, we can get a structure in a week. If you have 100 structures, that two years. 100 structures in your predictor is likely almost a coffee break. So that your predictor is not going to be as good, but you have to compare that to the cost and effort of spending two years in the cryem lab. The facility we have here at SciLife Lab, our estimated running cost for that is a bit over 3,000 euros per day. Because that's the equipment, cost, people, consumables, lab space, rent, and everything. Multiply that by two years, and that experiment is starting to be pretty costly. So it all depends, is it worth it? Yes, it's better, but is it worth it? And I would argue that in 90% of the case, your predictor is going to be more important. So I think we already covered this here, that helices grow gradually, but very fast, because you can, you can add to an alpha helix slowly. The special property with beta sheets that I didn't talk about that we'll come back to, they grow slower, but it's also, you either, it's like being pregnant. You either have a beta sheet or don't. Uh, it's very hard to gradually grow a beta sheet one strand is no sheet. When you have two strands, you have your sheet. So you, it's an all or nothing transition, just like breaking a, uh, a um, light bulb. We're going to come back to that after Easter when we talk about phase transitions. So this is a much more well-defined phase transition. This one grows gradually. I will very briefly cover the properties of amino acids too. We've done that too, so I'm going to skip through this a little bit quicker. Three-letter code, one-letter code, the abundance. We've already covered this, and as a reality check, what determines the abundance? No. It's a good, it's a good guess. <laughs> but <laughs> it's, the relative abundance is how frequent these amino acids are in nature. And that's determined by... And that reminds me of a very fun story a bunch of years ago. A student, it was a, a, in physics, in Boltzmann, you have this partition function, right? Which determines everything in your system. And do you remember what, say, what letter people occasionally use for that? Z. Capital Z. And there was a question about this on our exam, and the student was probably not the world's smartest student, but 
In physics, one nice thing about physics is not about learning things by heart. Uh, you learn concepts and you're allowed to have this gigantic formula at the test. <laughs> this student probably didn't know what Z was, so he kept looking this up in the formula until he find that Z was also used for the atomic number. <laughs> and then he used the atomic number in all these equations. Uh, 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 sorry. Uh. <laughs> the abundance here is determined by what? The number of codons. The number of codons. Uh, but this, your answer was not as stupid as you might think it was, because this bears on the same. We keep talking about the fact that we have mutations in amino acids or something, right? And that the mutations the amino acids might influence the free energy. And what would determine if a mutation is good or bad? It would be very obvious to say the Boltzmann distribution, right? But the Boltzmann distribution depends on something you did in this labs. The Boltzmann distribution depends on sampling all states, that you go back and forth between them and realize that some are better and worse. Once you have created a protein in your ribosome, you don't change the sequence. So the Boltzmann distribution does not explain why mutations happen or not. And this comes down with this detailed balance. You have a continuous flux between states. If you do not have a flux between states, they don't equilibrate. So different mutations, we can't explain those equilibrations. If we look exactly that way, it's very natural to think it is, but it's wrong, and which is quite fun. But this abundance is determined by the codons. Uh, and now I'm adding a column here, delta G solvation, and there are some gigantic numbers here. Uh, this is, uh, no, yes. These are some very large ones. There are some that are only marginally solved, and there are even some ones that are positive. If we look at the very, some that are very large here, glutamic acid, aspartic acid, um, histidine, and lysine, and arginine. Why are they so large and negative? Charge. They have charges. And those charges are just going to be loved to be what, because the solvation we always measure, what is the cost of having this in vacuum or oil compared to having it in water? Those charges are going to be hates to be in vacuum or oil, so that they want to be in water. Proline I already spoke a little bit about, uh, which is an amino acid. And I know you probably know this, but I'm also going to show it anyway. Normally, this is an isolated amino acid in this Twitter ionic form. And then we have the carboxyl group here, COO, negative charge. In a normal amino acid, I would have an NH3 plus here, but in proline, I have an NH2 plus. So proline lacks one hydrogen compared to all the other amino acids. When I put this in a peptide chain, both of those hydrogens will disappear. And then I don't have the hydrogen on the nitrogen there anymore. And that's why it can't really participate in all these. All the hydrogen bonds that I've been showing for both these secondary structures, proline is the odd one out there. It doesn't have the hydrogen that enables it to participate in those hydrogen bonds. So it's amazingly good at breaking helices. If you just see their secondary structure and you see a proline in the middle, yeah, I don't even need a bioinformatics predictor. I can, it's going to at least going to be a kink in the helix. Why would proline have come about then? It seems, or what, I guess what are its advantages if it's just It's pretty good if you want a kink in your helix. Uh, and that's, that answer is not as stupid as it might sound. Uh, the world, proteins does not just consist of helices that are 100 or 200 residues long. Um, so in many cases, in particular a membrane protein, it's actually a membrane helix should be roughly 20 residues because that's the average thickness of a membrane. Uh, on the other hand, you want this helix to be very stable. Uh, if this helix is a bit floppy, so if you had a helix that was very strong helix and then you gradually started to have residues that are less and less favorable to be in helical form, you would have a helix that had very weak and floppy ends, right? It would not be entirely clear where the helix stops and where the helix starts. On the other hand, you can have a helix that is 20 super strong alpha helical residues and boom, then a proline. So then you would have a helix that is rigid, it's clear, it's helical, it's going to be super happy in the membrane. And the second you're out of the membrane, you break your helix and you have a small loop and then you form a new helix. So that helices are good, but occasionally you need a loop too. So it's, uh, and we frequently use that, uh, let's say glycine, glycine, proline, glycine, before or after a helix to make sure that it's only 20 residues of helix. Good question. Glycine is pretty much the opposite of proline, but it ends up having the same effect. So glycine is, because of this lack of cytine, glycine is so floppy. So that glycine creates what I just said, glycine, glycine, proline, glycine. Those glycines are also good because they don't really want to form helices either. 
If we just had the glycines there, we would get a helix that gradually became more and more flexible. But glycine together with proline is a great way of breaking a helix. Um, and then we have all these hydrophobic residues. Um, I'm not going to go through them in detail, but there is a bit of nomenclature here that you might find out in your career. That first carbon is called the alpha carbon in the amino acid. And then as we go out the side chain, we start enumerating this with Greek letters. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta. And in some cases, you, here's alpha and there's beta. And then you have a branch here. So after the beta, you have one carbon there and one carbon there. And then we call them gamma 1 and gamma 2. So the more, in particular, when you have these branches, you get small and bulky residues. Um, that can be very important on the inside of protein. This one is going to hate to face the water. And then our last friend, cysteine. I didn't bring this up. Cysteine is a pretty normal amino acid, but it has a sulfur. And normally you have a hydrogen bond to that sulfur too. The special thing with this sulfur, if you oxidize, if you have two of these close to each other and oxidize them, they can let go of those proteins. And that's Java. I hate Java because it interrupts my presentation. Um, if you have two of these close to each other, they can oxidize, so you let go of the two hydrogens, and then you form a, not just an inter electrostatic interaction, but a real covalent bond between the two sulfurs. It's going to be super strong. And that is a non-local interaction in the chain. I don't know, did you talk about this in the bioinformatics course? Okay. This fixes structure in space, which can occasionally be really useful. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second, and I'm going to show you a protein. What do you think about this protein? Floppy. It looks really floppy, right? Is this even a protein? Is it more like a molten globular or something? You would be forgiven to think so. Uh, I'll help you a little bit. All the side chains. Does it become clearer? No, not, at least not to me. Uh, there are side chains all over the place. If I just saw this, I would say that, yeah, this is just a chain we had. We put it in a computer. It's been flexible. It's flopping around. If we start, if I could turn this into a movie, you would just see it moving around. It would not really have any well-defined structure. This could be a sequence that doesn't fold the protein. But now you might start to see some. We have something there. And it's yellow. And you have something there. And it's yellow. And you have something there that's yellow. So this small piece has three disulfide bridges. And it's even more, you might not see it, but the, the chain here starts and goes from blue and through the color of the spectrum all the way to red. And these, not, these disulfide bridges are actually so complicated that they literally formed a knot of the structure. So you can't unfold the structure without breaking those disulfide bridges. So this is a super rigid structure. It's even called a cysteine knot. So what do you think this could be useful for? It's a protein that is very hard to unfold. It's a toxin. So it's a spider toxin. And the snakes frequently have similar toxins. And because it's so hard to unfold, right? So this is, if this one comes in and binds, in particular to voltage sensors, actually, uh, this will bind to the voltage sensor and influence. And depending what sensor it is, it will either close them or open them. But it's very hard for your body to unfold them because they're so rigid and hard and you have all these disulfide bridges. This particular one is actually even, it's called Hana toxin, which has a fun story behind it. Kenton Schwartz who discovered it, named it after his daughter. Uh, which I guess, if you're fifth, I have a 13 year old daughter and I think the cool, if you're 15 year old, it's pretty cool to have a toxin named after you, I guess. Uh, so the reason that those, di what those disulfide bridges do, they really, they can lock in structures and they can lock in structures super hard. It's frequently used in experiments for cross-linking or so, but uh, it's a non-local interaction. And they can be super hard to predict because you have no idea where they are in sequence, right? But if you make a bioinformatics predictor and then suddenly you start having two, self, uh, two cysteines close to each other, you can, of course, test this. You can test what happens if you oxidize them. Um, even if you just have one cysteine, you can take another residue. If you have a model and you think that this model would work, you can mutate two residues to cysteine and see, can I form a disulfide bridge here? And the final residue here is tryptophan. Big, bulky residue. It's an extremely rare residue to have. A normal protein might have one or two of them. And that's simply because they're so large that they're hard to pack in anything. There are two cool things with tryptophan. First, 
Tryptophan is fluorescent, actually, with these rings. So that you frequently, and this is the reason I mentioned it, you can occasionally use tryptophan in biochemistry experiments because this, I think it absorbs around just under 300 nanometers and uh, then it fluoresces the emission at around 300 to 350. But the cool thing is that the emission depends on its surroundings. So why is the emission wavelength around 300 to 350 why it absorbs at 270 or 280? It's a bit of physics. Not all the energy that is absorbed can be emitted. No, so that the wavelength is inversely proportional to the frequency. So it apparently it absorbs at higher frequency and releases energy at lower frequency. And if you go into quantum mechanics, the frequency is proportional to the energy of the photons. So it, if you, have, you can absorb, you can never ever release photons of a higher energy than the ones you absorb. So you absorb at a higher energy, you lose some energy internally, and then when you release the light as emission again, it has to have lower energy. So you always, the wavelength always increases in fluorescence in the emission compared to where you absorb. The reason why this works is because tryptophan is so rare. Because if you only have one tryptophan in your protein, you know what's surrounding you're studying. And if you then know that, I don't remember exactly what the pattern in this fluorescence is, but if you only have one tryptophan, you can use this fluorescence to make predictions about does this tryptophan have, say, a polar or nonpolar surrounding. And this has actually been used for a small protein to create a protein called TRP cage, tryptophan cage. It's, a it's an artificial protein. And this is frequently cited as the world's smallest protein. And the reason for that is that with the side chains and everything, that tryptophan is actually completely buried. So it's not exposed to the solvent at all. We can see that with the tryptophan fluorescence. And it's a protein that's like just under 20 residues long. Um, many would call it a polypeptide, but the definition that we frequently use for a protein that you have some residues, in this case one, that is completely buried and not exposed to the solvent. Why is it useful to have a small protein? You can certainly bind to many things and everything, but one thing is that can help us to learn about some processes, right? And a small protein, we can even fold in a computer. So this is a folding of the tryptophan cage, and I should have started that automatically. That colleagues of us ran a bunch of years ago. So you see, can you imagine what the protein is doing here? So you see that it collapsed very quickly, right? And that's this molten globular, but then it has to keep exploring things. It's searching here, trying different things. It's not really finding anything good. So here's the part where we're exploring entropy, trying lots of different things. And this is a fairly good state. There appear to be lots of microstates related to this one. And all these variations of the side chain, this is basically we're exploring different microstates, but the overall state is that we have the tryptophan bound here in the middle. And I don't forget whether this is the folded state or we're going to get one last transition at the end here. But we're very close to the folded state. No, that was the folded state. So this is something you can fold in a couple of microseconds in a small computer. We can fold far larger proteins today. The, but the important thing here is that we had this important discussion. You brought up the argument that do we really reach the global minimum in free energy? And at least for these small proteins, it is true. And we can kind of prove that, that we can formulate the rules of physics and nature, and we can still predict that the folded state is right. And this corresponds perfectly to the experimentally determined states. We have a bunch of polar or charged residues too. Uh, we've, I'm not going to go through and cover the residues again, but I'm going to try to take this from a slightly different point of view. Remember that I said that the interior of proteins was typically uncharged, because we don't want things exposed. We don't want to, we take, want to take the hydrophobic things and turn them inside. That typically means that the polar charged residues tend to be in this turn loop region. So for instance, if you have a membrane protein, the loops are going to be outside the membrane. We're going to come back to that the week after Easter. Uh, so it's very favorable to put the charged parts outside the membrane. Um, the polar can hydrogen bonds to water um, and the polypeptide chain. Uh, while, and the charged, ones are, the charged ones are similar but much stronger. There is there is no rule in biology without an exceptions. I would say that the rule is that these are always on the surface with those exceptions that occasionally you need them on the inside of the protein to create a binding site or a motion or something. But there is one more fun effect. Um, in a helix, do you remember that I spoke about the helix dipole? The effect of the helix dipole is that you have 
all these peptide bonds, which on the inside here is that you have, okay, let's see. So here you have an oxygen, and then you have a carbon, and then you see a little bit of blue there, that's a nitrogen, and then I've hidden the hydrogen behind that one. And here's the opposite, here we don't see the oxygen, the carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen. The oxygen is strongly negatively charged, and that hydrogen is strongly positively charged. But the point is that all these dipoles point in the same direction, so they keep adding up. So the net effect of all these 20 or so dipoles here is that the equivalent of having one gigantic dipole that goes from the oxygen terminus, the red, to the nitrogen terminus, the blue. So it points against the direction of the helix. But what is a dipole? A dipole we can kind of describe with the equivalent of having a small charged on one end and having a small charge of another sign at the other end. So this is going to effectively going to be like as if we had a big negative charge here. And that's going to work really well if you combine that with a positively charged residue here, just to finish off the dipole. And conversely here, here we have a dipole that's point as if we had a positive charge here. And then the helix is actually going to like a whole lot to put a negatively charged residue here. So this is called helix capping, that we frequently have positive charges at the end of the C terminus and frequently have negative charges at the N terminus. The reason why I show you that is a funny result, which relates to what I said before. It appears as if amino acids seem to occur in places where they stabilize the structure. Now, this might sound completely obvious, but it's not obvious because this is no Boltzmann distribution. They don't change. We don't have this protein continuously swapping between the N and C terminus. The residues do not move around. So the residues are there, they are fixed. They are fixed by evolution or something. And of course, this is related to evolution, but it's not just a simple Boltzmann distribution. But there appears to be some connection here where where do residues occur? Where do proteins put residues? And something that is very, looks very similar to free energies and Boltzmann distribution. So this is, of course, based on the fact that evolutionary, it will stabilize the structure, and somehow it's good for nature to have stable structures. Those will somehow be better than non-stable structures. And this in turn is very much related to the fact, you remember that I said that a protein is only stabilized by a few hydrogen bonds. If you make one or two minor disturbances in the protein, you might very well completely kill the structure. So it's very fragile, but we can't quite put our finger on this yet. It looks like the Boltzmann distribution, but it's not the Boltzmann distribution. It walks like one and quacks like one, but it isn't. Um, the hydrophobic moment, I'm not really going to talk too much about. Uh, for beta sheets, the point with beta sheets is that since you have every second residue on the inside and outside, we can create these layered structures where we have natural pockets or something. The equivalent of a helix is something called, this is a helical wheel. And it's a tip, this might sound like complete a mess, but it's not. Uh, there should be a one somewhere, yes, one. So if you look at the helix from the top, every residue, it's 3.6 residues per turn in a helix, and that corresponds to exactly 100 degrees of turning. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then we keep going around like that. If you take your residues and just put their names here, do you see that there are lots of black ones up there? Isoleucine and leucine, and then there might be a bunch of well, at least a bunch of charged ones here. The charges are a bit different. So this appears to be a helix that on average is kind of between hydrophobic and hydrophilic, but it does so by being very hydrophobic on one side and very water soluble on the other side. So what do you think would happen to a helix like that? It could be part of a channel, so that, and in that case, that's actually a good one. I was, I, was, I was initially thinking that this would likely be an interfacial helix that would lie in the membrane surface. So it would turn its hydrophobic side to the membrane, its hydrophilic side to the water. It's just as right to say that it could be part of a channel, because this channel would need to turn the outside to the membrane, right, where it should be hydrophobic. But on the inside, to be able to conduct ions or something, you would something that's polar. So in that case, that would be the membrane side, and this side would face the pore in the membrane. And the final part are these titratable amino acids. Um, we talked about those yesterday, so I'm not going to cover it again. You should be aware that histidine is really dangerous, 6.5, way too close to 7. You can easily have this shift up or down, so this can be pretty much anything. 
And the complication with histidine is even when it's not charged, it's still not nice. <laughs> there are two places where you can put a proton here, either on the delta or epsilon nitrogen. Where do you typically have the proton? Beats me. <laughs> it's 50-50. There, there is a, I never even, I don't even remember which one is. I think it's the delta one that's slightly better. But now you're talking about difference of 0 0.1 in pH units. This is so close that you can't predict it. It's going to depend entirely on the surrounding. But this is hopeless. If you have a PDB file or something, can you see this in a PDB file? Why can't you see it in a PDB file? Don't have the resolution atoms, don't so hydrogens are typically not present in PDB files because hydrogens don't scatter electrons well enough by definition, because the electron hydrogens are usually slightly positive, right? It has given up its electron to the next higher atom. And because it's the electron scattering the X-ray, if the electrons has left the hydrogen, you're not going to see the hydrogen in X-ray. Today, some X-ray structure are actually starting to become so high resolution that you can see faint hydrogens, but in general, you can't. Can you see it with cryen? Why? No, you can't. The, the, res the resolution in cryem is too low. The best, theoretical, the best theoretical resolution with today's sensors is roughly 1.7. There are no structures that are close to that resolution. In practice, the best one are around 3. And the length here is 1 angstrom. So that you can't see that. That's a bit tough. So what do we do in practice? We're going to need to model something. I need, there might be a difference between whether it's the delta or epsilon. In theory, you could use NMR, right? But then you're starting to need to book an NMR. So if I give you a protein and I would ask, if you will get a protein. And sometime after Easter, you're going to start doing some models and quick simulations. Uh, I don't think you want to start booking an NMR machine for that lab. It's going to be a bit costly and complicated. So first one, you can guess. That's what people frequently do. It might not be the end of the world because we can rotate around that bond, right? So if you do it wrong, the entire thing will rotate. It's not symmetric, but it's not extremely bad. The other thing, what you will frequently see in a PDB file, is that you have a neighbor residue here. You might have a residue, say, glutamic acid or something, with an oxygen here. Where do you think the hydrogen is now, if you have another residue with an oxygen here? Then there is likely a hydrogen bond here, right? So you don't see the hydrogen, but you can see the hydrogen bonding partner. Because these are going to be polar hydrogens. There is no way this is going to stick into a hydrophobic region. So if you have, normally you can see that there is an oxygen either in one or both places. And if you see that oxygen, you can use the position of that oxygen to determine where the hydrogen is. That can certainly be the case. And if you have a binding site, but, but again, that, that will depend a bit on the pKa value and everything. It's, it's not obvious because, again, both of these can exist, right? And occasionally, it, occasionally it's better to have the protonated, and in other cases, it might be better to have the unprotonated state. But there is the reason why these oxygens in particular are important. There is no way you can have a negative nitrogen here right next to a negative oxygen and have them interact. They would hate each other. The only reason they would be close to each other is because there is a hydrogen between them and mediating that interaction. So if you don't see the oxygens, you don't know. But if you do see an oxygen there, you probably got it. But there's one thing that can go wrong here. This sounds really good, right? You can just take the PDB file and terminate. But there's a caveat emptor here. You don't know if they discharge actually. It's worse than that. How do you think that they got that PDB structure? So remember, what is the experimental results from X-ray crystallography? No, structure factors. Structure factors. How do you get from the structure factors to a PDB file? A model. So somebody already put this in a computer. Somebody put it in a computer. They might have guessed, hopefully smart, they guessed where they had their hydrogen. So the funny thing that if you take this part and put a hydrogen here, somehow all the oxygen is really close to that one is going to like you because to the point, that PDB file is already a model. You think of it as an experimental result, but the experimental result is only the raw structure factors. In most cases, this is right, but you should be aware that somebody already modeled this before you started your model. 
So if in doubt, you might, have actually, you might actually have to go back all the way to the original structure factors or cryie and micrographs. There are plenty of structures in the PDB that have been proven to be wrong. Or that the model is wrong. The original experimental data was frequently right. So that even the thing that we traditionally think of as experimental results depend, rely much more on computer models than you might think. So when it comes to these charges, uh, there are a bunch of these. Uh, arginine, for instance, unless you have a very special reason to believe that that should be neutral, it will require some pretty extreme pHs for this to change. The thing that I showed you in that quick movie of the membrane protein actually turned out to be arginine residues, and that's what's made it so amazing. So this is one of the residues that will virtually never ever be uncharged, and yet we had it in a membrane protein. And not just one, but one, two, three, four arginines. We will talk about that when we talk about membrane proteins. It actually turns out that this is useful for nature, not just that it's useful to have charges, but there are a bunch of processes that actually turn out to be pH regulated. So many of the channels that in your body are regulated by your nervous system, by voltage, in a simpler organism by a bacterium, would you have a voltage-gated channel in a bacterium? Because a bacterium doesn't have a nervous system, right? So similar channels in a bacterium is typically pH regulated. So that the bacterium can use pH to regulate things. Bacterium is actually smarter. It's much more efficient and cheaper. Um, we get some things with the nervous system, but our nervous system is pretty expensive to keep running in terms of energy. Uh, there are a bunch of things we can use this with protein stability or salt bridges. So depending on pH, things will either bind or unbind. Uh, DNA protein interactions, uh, all those big phosphates, we talked about that when I talked about the DNA structure, right? So depending on the pH, DNA will undergo different transitions and everything. So it's, charges are very useful. The other thing that's cool that some of the ion channels, in particular, this is not a potassium channel, but a ligand-gated channel. So in a human, it would be ligand-gated, and then some bacteria, it turns out to be pH-gated. So this is a model of a channel that a talented French postdoc in my group built a bunch of years ago. So GLIC here is just a, it's gliobacteria visualis, I think, ligand-gated ion channel. So it's just an abbreviation of the name of the channel. The colors here correspond to the five subunits. You can only see three of them here. The gray part here is the membrane, and then we actually have all the water and ions and everything around it. If I tried to show you the movie here, you would not see anything. So what Samuel then did is he's just showing the five central helices around the pore, right in the middle of this channel that either conducts ions or not. And this is a channel where the X-ray structure is obtained at pH 4.6, where it's completely open. But then we also know that this one should be closed at pH 7. And a couple of years later, we even obtained a closed structure of pH 7. Uh, so initially, I think we're going to start with the blue helices here, and they will gradually move to the red helices in a simulation. And the only thing we're doing in this simulation is that we have this entire system, but we're changing the titration state of the residues. And then let's see if this works. So what you're going to see here is that normally you have lots of water going through this channel. You have some hydrophobic residues, but typically the electrostatic charges here are too large, so they will repel each other. And gradually the helices are closing in on each other. And you will see that this one is eventually going to overlap with the blue ones. And you see that the water treader is almost breaking up. You see, oh, see now there's a hydrophobic region here between, between these residues. And eventually this is going to close more and more and more and more. And by now we no longer have the water pore going through here. So now this is a non-conducting channel. And this by the time we are at two microseconds or so. So this channel has now closed. And this is simple and biophysical enough that you can get it in a reasonably fast simulation. And although I'm only showing, and now these helices overlap virtually perfectly, it's a relatively small motion. So that it's by no means a small system, it's much more complicated than the simple stuff you studied in the lab. But it is exactly the same phenomena, that you have a, start, a system with two states. You have one state that's more favorable at pH 6, 4.6, the open one. You have a second state that is more stable at pH 4.7. So depending on the external conditions, nature can cause this system to move between two states. This is how it would work in a bacterium. In a human, you would rather have something bind out here. And when something binds out here, this channel opens. And this happens all the time in your nerve cells because these are the channels that are part of the synapse. So the synaptic transmission, when you move the nerve signal from one nerve cell to the next nerve signal, the neurotransmitter is binding these channels and then they open this one. Is it uh, so what causes the, the, the 
explosion of the channel? Is, is there any history that sort of measures? So, do you know what? This is a really good question. Um, I'll get back to that in a second. I'm just going to tell you a little bit more. Anyway, you can start there. So with the question is whether it was a histidine or something that closed this channel. We and other groups have been searching for this for 10 years. Yes, there are histidines. But we can mute it away, those histidines. This still works. We, I think we have tried, like, together with other groups, we have tried, like, some 40 or 50 mutants here. We have, this far, we have found lots of mutations that influence this. But this far, we have not found one single residue that really explains it. There are some charged residues up here. And in principle, it sounds fairly reasonable, right? That if you have a charged residue, say, at the top of these helices, if they are charged at pH 4.6, they would repel each other. And then we remove the charge, they would not repel each other so strongly. And then they would close. It's a really good model. There's only one problem with that model. What did I say at the beginning of this lecture? It's wrong. <laughs> And no matter how, you know, this is, is better than that. We've calculated those uh, pH, the titration states with uh, continuum electrostatics and everything, and you can prove that they change titration state. That is worth absolutely nothing because we can mutate away the residue and the channel still works. So this is still an open debate. We do not know exactly what residues in the bacteria is the reason for the pH sensitivity. It could very well be that it's a collective effect. You haven't asked me something else. Um, these channels, if we forget about the bacterium for a second, these channels are important for a bunch of reasons. Uh, and they're, they kind of, they're some of the most important channels in your nervous system. Two of the more, there are three important ones. One of them is called the acetylcholine receptor. And it's famous because it's blocked by cobra toxin. So that this, uh, when the cobra bites you, this toxin blocks the acetylcholine receptor. And then the nerve signal works great. It goes to the end of one nerve cell. And then the nerve signal can't pass on to the next nerve cell. Uh, same thing here, a toxin prevents the channel from working. Another very common channel is the gamma butyric acid channel. So and that builds a small amino acid actually, gamma butyric acid. It's, a non it's one of those amino acids, it's an extra methyl group on the alpha carbon. Uh, so it's not one of the 20 essential ones. That one is very important in your brain and it's also the main target of anesthetics. So when you want to sedate somebody with a propofol, isoflurane, desflurane, we now know that these anesthetics bind, oops, these anesthetics bind to the channel and influence how quickly these channels open. So that these are, because these are situated between nerve cells, they're really beautiful ways to start to modulate your nervous system. It's Thursday, even before the Easter weekend, at least I'm going to have a glass of wine tonight. Uh, when I have a glass of wine, the alcohol will bind to lots of places, but in particular to the glycine receptor. Looks just like this one. And this is the reason we get this intoxicating effects, because it influences my nerve signals. Um, so a pretty pleasant way. It's purely for research reasons, of course. Um, so what all these things have in common, that they're part of your nervous system and they modulate your nervous system. And now a friend of order would say something. What was Glick? No, well, Glick was a particular line. The G here was for Gliobacter bichiolis, which was what type of organism? Bacterium. Do you see any problem with that? Why would you have a channel like this in a bacterium? So what do you know about the nervous system of bacteria? So why would you have a channel like that in a bacterium? We don't know. So in this case, it definitely, it, it, it's a pH regulated structure that conducts ions, right? But in the grand scheme of evolution, we don't know, but this is very common. And it actually turns out the same way we had some pH gated, pH gated channels that are very similar to the voltage gated channels in a human. It's virtually almost every single complicated structure we have in human also exists in a bacteria, usually in a much simpler form, and it's not as advanced. And that's likely because evolution, it's obviously it's related to evolution. Uh, they are like 25 to 30 percent identical in sequence, so there's no, it's no question they're evolutionary related. But exactly why, we don't know. The reason why this is important is that it's much easier to determine structure of bacterial proteins. Um, that is also an open question. For some reason, human proteins, in particular membrane proteins, tend to be much floppier, they're less stable, they're harder to overexpress and everything. We don't know why. That's just the case. 
And you could argue that's not so bad. We can just use the bacterial ones. The problem is that the Glick channel, if you give the Glick channel slightly longer chain alcohols or anesthetics, it actually behaves the opposite of human proteins. I'll come back to that. I'm going to talk a little bit about our research after Easter. But it's not as all as obvious as we used to think 20 years ago that human and bacterial channels that are homologs behave the same way. They can be very different. And in this case, it turns out that I can swap one amino acid in this channel right in the middle here, and I get it to behave like a human channel. I have no idea whether these exist in Archaea. Uh, it's a very good question. We can actually, that's, you can search it yourself. I can give you the sequence so you can see if you find it anywhere. Because this is also the problem, right? It might seem obvious to search for this, but what people have to do, you have to start, find a sequence, in particular a colleague of mine, Eric Jacobson at UIUC. In a number of cases, he's just taking a class of channels, and then you spend a huge amount of time just digging through these databases. Do you find something? Is this interesting? Does it behave the same way? I'm not sure, have you looked at genome annotation in the bioinformatics course? Most things that there was a potential protein. And that's all we know about it. Somebody found a sequence at some point that might or might not be a protein. And nobody has ever studied it. And then you need to convince somebody to study this biochemically. Can we isolate it? Is it an ion channel? At that point, you would have to show, does it have similar properties to the human channels? And that we can certainly do in experiment, but it, it's, it's no small amount of work. And then what's happened the last five, six years, now we actually have structures of the human channels too. And I, I predict that this is going to be an explosion in what you call neuropharmaceuticals, because we have structures of a bunch of these in the human system. And then we can, of course, start to target drug design to influence your nerve system, which is going to be pretty cool. More powerful one. That would actually, you could, of course, you might, first you might be able to design drugs that remove the alcohol toxicity. Uh, you might be able to design drugs to combat alcoholism, which so that's a very complicated disease. Uh, but even anesthetics. Uh, anesthetics is complicated. Uh, you might think that it's a simple field, and it is to some extent, but we have no idea of exact the molecular effects. It also turns out that it's virtually all anesthetics have some side effects, which is not a problem if anybody is going to sedate you because you're young and usually healthy. If somebody is like 95-year-old obese and everything, it gets to the point where a good anest uh, anesthetician is going to say, let's try to avoid anesthetics or let's at least try to avoid general anesthetics because there is like a one in a 10,000 chance that you will die on the operating table. So it's not, can we design better anesthetics to control this better? We could improve healthcare a lot. We're starting to branch into science there. I'm going to talk more about our science later because that <coughs> it's hard to stop me. Um, what I've mostly been covering here is chapters 7 and 10. There is a reason why I'm skipping one chapter, chapter 8. Chapter 8 is full of beautiful heavy mathematics. I'm going to come back to that after your Easter break, but I figured to make sure that you actually show up for the course again after Easter, it's better to wait with that chapter. Uh, and chapter 8 will likely be the last really heavy theoretical chapter we go through. So what I'm going to do in chapter 8 then is I'm, then I'm going to tie up the sec from the other point of view and going to show that some of these things where I argued for special cases, they're actually universal. Phase transitions and everything, we can classify phase transitions even in biological systems. And after that, later on in those two weeks, I'm going to start, I will actually put up those le these lectures already next week if you want to start studying them and I will be around if you have questions. But then we're going to branch out a little bit more into real proteins, modeling of real proteins and simulations that the book doesn't really cover in detail. Uh, I will, we will have some extra reading material for you there. And then we're gradually going to start applying some of the things you learned in the lab to real systems. Important things to think about. Start, well, start thinking about things for the entire week and try to interpret the biological things that we now get back to in terms of what you learned with free energy, enthalpy and entropy. It will help you a lot and it will give you these gut feelings. I have a bunch of study questions here too. The last few study questions here are related to the labs. Uh, and we will go through that after Easter when you're all back. And then I think I'll release you four minutes early today. Do you have any questions? <laughs>